Today is August 10th, 2017, and we are at the DeLand House. Today I'm speaking with Jimmy Lawrence, and this is going to be a history interview with Jimmy. I am Margaret Jones. I am a volunteer with the West Volusia Historical Society and a friend of Jimmy and Patty's. Jimmy, the Rose family and the Lawrence family have, have quite a history here in West Volusia. We've been talking about this before today, and um, I'd like to give me a little bit about how your families got here and those two families and when you were born in your given name. The family got here uh, in 1913. Uh, they rode by train from the old depot to the what is now the spur line here. Got off the train in Mich on Michigan Avenue and started living at 348 Michigan Avenue. So they didn't have far to walk when they got here. Um, the Michigan Avenue house um, that they lived in burned down uh, a few years ago, but the upstairs was uh, where the family lived. Oh, my grandfather and grandma, and uh, there were four kids. They lived upstairs, and Rhodes Grocery was downstairs. And your grandfather's name was? My grandfather was Hervey Lee Rhodes. R O D E S. Okay. And uh, they, the Rhodes family, uh, has roots back into the, I don't know, the 17, 1800s in West Virginia area. My great grandfather, who was, I was named for him, uh, James Yancey Rhodes, came down here in the late 1800s. Um, to pursue citrus. And the uh, family uh, followed, my grandfather followed his father down here. Uh, currently we have five generations of the Lawrence and Rhodes family buried in Oakdale Cemetery here in, in Deland. Um, like I say, they got here in 1913. Uh, my grandfather was uh, somewhat of an entrepreneur. He uh, was a building contractor, and he also had a brick and block plant that was on the railroad spur that came in uh, from the old station, uh, where he did they did made bricks and concrete block. He also, along with my father, had a hand in building the Trinity Methodist Church in 1925-26. Uh, um, and then my grandfather also had Rhodes Cola. It's on South Boulevard and a building currently uh, occupied by Calkins Electric Company. Uh, and that was where he bottled uh, what we would think of today as Coca-Cola. In fact, eventually he sold Rhodes Cola uh, to Deland Bottling, which was bottling Coca-Cola. Nobody uh, would have known Coca-Cola would have been in Deland, Coca-Cola Bottling Company. Yeah. Yeah. But um, the, that, the Lawrence side of the family got here. My dad came down from Georgia where he was born in the 20s. I uh, met my mom, and they married, and got three brothers, uh, Billy, uh, Tommy, and myself. I was a baby. And, uh, by 13 years. By 13 years, right. Uh, Brother Billy had to babysit me sometimes because uh, mom was, was working and whatnot. The, uh, she worked at the old Coastline Freight Office right down uh, on Michigan Avenue, just a couple of blocks up from here. Mm -hmm. She worked there for many years. Uh, but then Billy had to babysit me and he wasn't real happy about that. <laughs> he was accused uh, by one of his dates one time of opening the door when 
they were going around the corner and trying to get me out of the car. <laughs> but I mean, he was he was not successful in that. Your mother's name? Mom was Emily Rhodes Lawrence. Uh, she was actually born in West Virginia. Okay. Uh, and your dad? Uh, Herman Willie. It's a, it was supposed to have been William, but whoever put it in the family Bible just used shorthand and put Willie. So he was known by folks around here as E.W. You had an aunt in there you were telling me about. Uh, so. Yep, yeah, my aunt uh, Marguerite, uh, also born in West Virginia. Uh, she married a gentleman named Lee Klingerman that had the the land fuel oil company and a gas station on Euclid Avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, she was like my second mama. Uh, in fact, my mother, who died just short of being 101, and my aunt Marguerite, who pet named by my oldest brother Billy, he couldn't say Marguerite. It came out Mammeet. So everybody knew her and called her Mammeet. Uh, but Mammy and Mama, uh, Mammy lived to be uh, just shy of a hundred, and in the, the, you know together for a century, and they never lived more than a half a mile apart. So, and the family was raised in the land on South Spring Garden, and uh, my grandfather and my dad built the house. And it's currently owned and uh, utilized by Holder Pest Control. Uh, kitty corner across from the old Stetson Mansion that uh, we used to have fun as kids uh, messing around. And your birth date was? Born on a cold January day, fourth day of January, 1944. And my mother argues with my birth certificate which says that I was born at 7.55. She says that it was eight o'clock because the steam whistle at the Conrad uh, Lumber Building was blowing when I was born. So she, she argued with that. <laughs> uh, Tell me a little bit about your early life and starting with school. And... Well, you know, the land was a whole lot smaller then than it is now. And as kids, we went everywhere on our bicycle. Uh, made no difference if we were going downtown or, you know, going to Blue Springs or wherever. We rode bicycles. Uh, and we behaved ourselves. Because if you did something wrong in the land then, before you got home, your parents would know about it. And there would be repercussions, we'll call them. But... Uh, there was a group of us that lived in that general vicinity of uh, town off the truck route. And all through school, uh, up to high school, we either rode our bicycles together to school or being the oldest one in the class by not failing a class, but because I was born in January um, and had a driver's license, we continued even uh, through high school, riding to school together, and had a you know had a good time, going to the Athens Theater for the Saturday afternoon double feature, and uh, you know with the Lone Ranger and the cartoons and you know the news features, uh, and we enjoyed doing that as a group. And I think if I remember correctly, it was twenty five cents to get in and that included a drink and popcorn. And all that time at the movie theater, which I think the parents enjoyed because it you know, kept us occupied all Saturday afternoon. How about your schools? You started out at? Well, uh, my schooling in the land, I started at the Wisconsin Avenue School, which is currently the, Booster, the Dempsey Brewster Annex on Wisconsin Avenue. I started there at six years old in 1950, and I started school in September. 
in October, my mother started working there as the school secretary, which l led me to not be late or, or uh, skip school. Uh, I had to behave myself because my mother was there. That's why you have this certificate from 1950-51 school year, Jimmy Lawrence, neither absent nor tardy for the whole year. Yeah, I had no real choice. <laughs> um, Back then, uh, we kind of, uh, if you were doing something in school you weren't supposed to and you got in trouble at school, you also got in trouble at home. Yes. The same thing. Yes. With, and Miss so. Brewster was the mm -hmm. principal then. Uh, and Miss Brewster and my mother were, you know, pretty pretty close because they worked together for many years. Uh, some of the kids would uh, harass me because you're Miss Brewster's pet. I only got the rubber tube one time in six years. <laughs> and after the Wisconsin Avenue, we what they call, we went across the field, which was a practice football field, to the junior high school which uh, is now currently housing the uh, school board. After junior high, we went up the hill to high school, uh, which the building no longer there. But um, while we were seniors, and I graduated in 1962, while we were seniors, when we left school for the uh, Christmas break, the principal indicated that they would let us know when to move into what we still call the new school, the one located at Plymouth and Hill. But prior to that, at the beginning of our senior year, they announced that the school colors were no longer purple and white. They were gonna be green and gold. The school fight song was no longer the alma mater. It was now just the, the fight song and we had a new alma mater that I had to learn to sing in the glee club, but I can't remember it now. <laughs> <laughs> you had no input into it. Oh, we had no, that was all decided by the school board um, and the principal. So when it came time to graduate uh, that June, we wanted to graduate in the old school because we had gone, and when I say we, the majority of our class and uh, there were only the two elementary schools then, Wisconsin Avenue and Boston Avenue, but we had gone to school together, some of us for 12 years, and most of us for, uh, for six years, from junior high through high school, mm -hmm. and we wanted to graduate in the old high school. And Mr. Bales, who was the principal at the time, said, no, you're going to graduate from the new high school. Uh, so. Authority ruled, and we did graduate from the new high school, begrudgingly. <laughs> Some of your friends' uh, names that we might be familiar with? That... Well, some of them. Uh, uh, one of them is Charlie Gilreath. His daddy had the uh, Napa Auto Store downtown, uh, which is now a restaurant, I believe. Uh, but the... Um, uh, Rick McGill. Uh, Rick's dad had McGill Paint Store on Georgia Avenue for all the long as I can ever remember. Uh, one of them that's still with us, uh, Pete Hebner, uh, who was an attorney in Daytona Beach. Uh, that's Ben Marshall, whose mother was the Cub Scout pack leader. Uh, and yeah, Richard, Richard Fisher, that's another one I thought of that has moved back into the area. And a number of our graduating class have moved back into the area since we graduated. But, uh, and there's several of the girls that were in, involved <laughs> that are still around. But uh, I don't, I talk about, I'll talk about my wife some. Okay. Well, when you graduated from Delano High School in 62, what did, what happened after then? Well, when I graduated in 62, the first thing that we did is in uh, early August, 
uh, I got to go to a Washington, D.C. for the National Safe Driving Rodeo um, Finals. Uh, I had been fortunate enough to win the local, the district, the state, and got to go to Washington, D.C. That was because of my good friend and mentor, the Judge Uriel Bunky Blunt, had been a very influential person on my life, and he also had been a national vice president of JCs, who co-sponsored the Safe Driving Rodeo. And a nice picture here. Uh, well, that um, the picture uh, that you, you may be looking at now is uh, uh, Patricia, uh, who was the state winner from Wyoming, and myself, and then Vice President Lyndon Johnson. Uh, we're presenting him with seat belts because part of the safe driving rodeo was to teach teenagers how to drive safely and seat belts were just coming into use then. So that was the theme of safety with seat belts. And we got to meet with uh, Lennon Johnson and on the Capitol steps. Well, the Lawrence family was, and, and Rhodes too, uh, involved very much in the ag. You yeah. were the ag family. I think you had everything <laughs> covered but cows. Yeah, well, we, we or had, maybe you had that for a while. We had a few, but <laughs> You were the fern, citrus, and chicken. Yes. And um, you graduated from high school, and Dad had Dad had a plan. Yes, he did. Um, Brother Billy uh, went briefly to the University of Florida. He came home to get be married, and he was uh, pretty much in charge of the fern operation, which was predominantly located then in the Delian Springs area. Uh, Brother Tommy went to the University of Florida, and he graduated, and he came back with a degree in fruit crops. So he took care of the family's orange groves. And I came along, and when I got out of the Army, I went in, into the Army uh, right again after high school, and uh, when I got home and got ready to go to the University of Florida, Daddy strongly suggested that I wanted to become a poultry scientist, which is a fancy word for an educated chicken farmer. Um, and back in those days, you listened to what dad said, plus he would pay if I went <laughs> uh, to poultry science, and I did. I graduated with a degree in poultry science, uh, or a major in poultry science, my degree in bachelor of science in agriculture. My dad had started Lawrence Farms out on Marsh Road in the uh, mid-30s. Um, and at that time, he had just the orange groves. And the first land that he bought, he got from uh, Mr. Marsh, who lived on Marsh Road. Uh, he bought like 40 acres on Marsh Road, Daddy did, um, from Mr. Marsh. And he said, I don't have the money to pay you now. Uh, but on a handshake, Daddy bought the 40 acres and paid Mr. Marsh and enlarged the farm to where we were. Uh, I had approximately 200 acres by the time uh, we, I came along. We had a chicken farm and ferneries across the road and orange groves. Uh, you had it covered. Yeah. <laughs> you certainly did. But Tell us. Oh, go ahead. No, I was Excuse gonna me. say. I was gonna say. Are, you, are, are we gonna talk a little bit about how I met my wife? That's the next question. <laughs> okay. Delivering that eggs. That ties in with the chicken farm. Part mm -hmm. of our farm was a egg producing farm. It wasn't for growers, and uh, we developed a commercial and a residential egg route. One of the stops on my egg route. Uh, was Boston Avenue School, uh, where my wife was a teacher, but it didn't know her at the time. But a mutual friend wanted to uh, get us together and meet each other. And my wife Patty's initial reaction, you want me to meet and date a chicken farmer? <laughs> and so uh, 
she and I both hedged for a while with the mutual friend uh, finally got us together. Uh, we had uh, dinner at her house and uh, the, fr the friend's house. And uh, the rest of the, as they say, is history. Uh, neither one of us had a date with anybody else after that. And we got married five months later. On Valentine's Day? On Valentine's Day, yeah. What year was that? <laughs> 76, I got it. 76. You're looking at uh, This is a test, right? Well, nah. Yeah, it was 1976. <laughs> Glad I wrote it down a few times. And, uh, but okay. I, liked, I got married on Valentine's Day mm -hmm. because in the fern business, Valentine's Day is one of the heaviest uh, days or weekends or weeks of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, so the previous weeks... Uh, we were busy getting ferns cut and packed and shipped and all that. Uh, the first break we had was Valentine's Day, and it happened to fall on a Saturday. So that's how we ended up on. Plus, it's easy for me to remember. <laughs> I can remember February 14th. <laughs> so, three children. We have three kids. Uh, the oldest is James Jr. Uh, he retired after 20 years in the military and has moved back to the land. Um, and our middle daughter, Ronette, is currently uh, working for Microsoft and doing something that I have no clue, but she works in Redmond Hills out around Seattle, Washington, uh, works with Bill Gates. So. And Bill Gates, she's chairman of a committee, you said, and Bill Gates comes to her meeting. Correct. And she, and Gordon Ronett, Bill Gates, is just one of the guys or gals. Uh, he doesn't try to railroad or anything, so mm -hmm. she likes that. And she's done very well there. And then our youngest is Leanne. Leanne is a school teacher following in her mother's footsteps because Patty's been teaching now for almost 50 years. But um, Right here in Deland. She teaches here in Deland at is it Freedom Elementary? Uh, Leanne, the daughter, does. She yes. teaches at uh, Freedom Elementary, and she's been teaching for 18 years now. Mm -hmm. And well, she's looking forward to retirement. <laughs> but Patty <laughs> has a good, good uh, background in, in uh, education. Tell us a little bit. Well, what Patty has done. Um, when we met, she was an elementary school teacher in Orange City, uh, and she's been to a number of schools in Lucia County, but. She's an ESC, exceptional student uh, educator, and works wonderful with kids. And uh, even, well, when we, for a short period of time, left the land and went, moved to Cedar Key, uh, I had sold the business, uh, and she had retired from Volusia County. And so we moved to Cedar Key, which Cedar Key on the Gulf Coast due west of Deland, not the Keys. Uh, we got there in August. In October, she got talked into going back to teaching in Levy County and Cedar Key because they needed an ESE teacher. And Cedar Key School, from three-year-old preschool to 12th grade, housed about 250 kids. And it was a, a rural school, according to the federal government. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, but it was hard to get teachers because Cedar Key was, you know, I don't know, 45 miles away from uh, near a city. But uh, she did that. And in the meantime, uh, they found out that I had a, a driver's license for driving buses. So I, while we were living in Cedar Key, she taught and I drove a school bus. So, uh, and we, and we enjoyed that. But then we, Leanne, our daughter, gave us two grandsons. And Grandma couldn't stay away from the grandsons, so we moved back to Deland, uh, which I'm glad, even though it's changed a lot. Mm -hmm. um, the evolution of your being in the uh, agriculture business in those three industries, can you just go and... Give us a little bit of that and then tell us how you got into the TV business. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, like, you know, like I say, I graduated from the University mm -hmm. of Florida and it was uh, in 
the general manager or some, so I don't know what the title was, of the chicken farm. Uh, and we had at the time, which was the largest in Volusia County, we had 50,000 laying hens. And then I raised from day old chicks to 20 weeks old when they became uh, adult laying hens, uh, around 40,000 uh, of those a year. And then we sold our eggs locally and also in a co-op in Orlando. Meanwhile, the fern industry was expanding. Uh, that grew. Brother Tommy got the uh, citrus. That expanded. Uh, problem was, and everything was pretty good until, uh, as far as the agriculture end of it goes, to 83, 85, and 89. Those all three were hard freeze years and virtually wiped out the citrus industry in, in Volusia County. Uh, by then, uh, we had opted out of the chicken business, which we shut down in 1984, much <laughs> to my pleasure. But uh, in the meantime, one of the neat things that we did, we were the only ones uh, in Lucia County, I for, know for sure, and possibly in the state of Florida, that our chicken farm, we, uh, Brother Tommy had purchased a large dryer. Um, it was a drum, just a circular drum long that you fed chicken manure into one end. Now, most of us know that chicken manure has a terrible odor. Uh, and also, if you put a little bit too much on your yard or flowers, they'll burn up. But this machine took them through at 375 degrees and burned up the feathers and the bones and the urea that made the chicken manure smell, smell so bad. When, not, when it came out of the other end, it was in pellets, and we bagged it. And it was known as Chickatee Green. And we sold it to a local department store, and they bought every bag we could produce. Was that roses? Yeah, that was roses, the the, roses. Uh, on South Boulevard. And uh, that, uh, what, that was a good, you know, we were, like I said, we were the only ones in Volusia County, so uh, we would go to neighboring chicken farms they would give us their manure if we would just haul it off. And we then turned it into chick tea green. So. You still had the, fer the ferns. Still had the, the ferns. At this point. Yeah. And what about the Campbell Soup Company involvement? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, laying hens only uh, are good for uh, a year, 13 months, something like that. Because the chicken is born with every egg they will ever lay is already in their body cavity. And when they get to the point where they're not laying much anymore, they aren't producing, but they're still eating. So we had a, a connection uh, with a supplier that would, uh, would come down with a semi-truck and we'd get a crew together at night so you could get the chickens, load them in a cake, and they would go to Douglas, Georgia to become ch uh, Campbell's Chicken Soup. How about that? You became a, a reporter on the TV well, at one point. It, um, after the, the three brothers being together and three being an odd number and me being the youngest brother, uh, I uh, opted to move from Lawrence Farms uh, to a company uh, called TM Communications, uh, owned by Times Mirror Corporation in California. They had the franchise for Volusia County, and built. We uh, they built the first uh, cable television system in Deland. At the time, I was kind of looking to get out of chicken business. I had a friend that was looking for somebody that knew the Deland area, uh, was familiar with Deland politics and or Volusia and all of Volusia County, and so 
I went to work for TM as their system manager. And January 4th, which is a very important day to me each year, uh, January 4th, 1971, we hooked up the first cable television uh, customer in West in Volusia. The, in West Volusia. And it's become and, and spe spectrum now. <laughs> didn't you host a game show? Oh, yes. Uh, we actually had live television that uh, if you were a cable customer, you could go to our, our channel. And uh, we had several nights a week a game show of bingo. And I was the uh, host pulling little balls out of the air machine that shakes them up. And the first person to call in with a bingo would win a prize, whether it be a you know, free months cable or you know, whatever. Uh, and I answered the phone one night, you know, and said, you know, do we have a winner? And she said, yes, Jimmy, I got bingo. It was my mother. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have the rules about you couldn't uh, have family play, so she got her free month of cable television. Um, that led into later on after, well, went from cable television, TM Communications was bought out by another company, and the new company and I didn't see eye to eye, so before they could invite me to leave, the Deland Chamber of Commerce had an opening for the executive director. And I applied for that and was selected. And uh, so I became the uh, executive director of the Deland Chamber of Commerce, which during my short tenure there was renamed Deland Area Chamber of Commerce. And I think it's been renamed now mm -hmm. uh, to include pretty much the West Volusia area, I think. Uh, the, the only one problem that the committee had before they offered me the job, they said, you know, uh, my current wife worked at the chamber as a secretary. She, they thought that might cause some problems. I said, I don't think so. I can correct that. So I fired her. <laughs> but uh, after a year there, uh, Brother Tommy came back. Brother Billy had left the farm, uh, and he said, you know, you want to come back to the farm? So mm -hmm. I went back to Lawrence Farms. Uh, you were on TV again, though. Well, in 83, mm -hmm. 85, 89, during those freezes, and uh, subsequently after any freeze, uh, local TV channels, channels would come out to our farm and interview me uh, as to what the damage might be or how cold did it get, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, one morning, a crew from uh, Channel 9 in Orlando came up, and we were discussing the freeze and the damage, and it was one of those bad freeze years. Uh, and I didn't know it until somebody called me and said, hey, you're on General, or Good Morning America. So I made it to Good Morning America, but I never got to see it. <laughs> uh, and then after that, if there were a freeze, uh, the stations for news would come out and interview me to uh, tell what the damages were going to be and that kind of thing. Uh, and in the process of when I left Lawrence Farms after, and I, I enjoyed what I did everywhere, but you know, opportunities came out, so opportunity came up and. Uh, we had expanded, my brother Tommy and I had expanded our operations, fern operations, with partners into Costa Rica. And we had a large farm and coast, fern operation in Costa Rica. But that was a tad bit too much for me. Uh, I still had a bunch of small town boy in me. So uh, I moved, uh, I, Tommy and I split up amicably and uh, I moved to the original packing shed that my father started in 1934 in De Leon Springs and had my own fern operation, uh, which was known as Sun Ridge Ferneries for unknown reasons. And 
when Daddy bought it in 34, it was called Sunridge. And fern growers, uh, for telling crews where to go, what name their ferneries. So each of the individual ferneries had a different name. You were president of the Florida Fern Growers Association. Yeah, time. Uh, I was president of the Florida Fern Growers Association in the 60s when we had some of those, uh, or a little bit later than that, during some hard freezes and there were water problems, primarily in the Pearson area, of people running out of water because as the fern growers were watering their ferns, it was drawing the water table down. And uh, so and, uh, as the president of the Fern Growers Association uh, had to defend our industry and its value, but we also figured out a way to help the people that got their wells go dry. Uh, we hired our own well driller and they would drill some of the wells deeper to where they could get water or we would replace their old pumps with a new pump so that they would have water and we could use the water for freeze protection. Because the St. John's River Water Management District was after us to not use the water. Uh, but that would have put an end to the industry in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. So all pretty well worked out. And from that venue, uh, I don't think I told you this before. Actually, I worked for Stetson University for two years in the athletic department as a, uh, in the development raising funds for the melching field, uh, also for the new softball complex and the new soccer complex. Mm -hmm. But after those about came to fruition, uh, I decided that, you know, I wanted to do something different, so. You kind of always wanted to be not a chicken farmer, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> but becoming a chicken farmer again never <laughs> entered my mind. But the, uh, that was, I sold my business and we moved to Cedar Key mm -hmm. and lived there for seven years. And then as I mentioned earlier, uh, our daughter gave us two grandsons mm -hmm. and came back. we came back to Deland. Tell us how the Ag Center got started in uh, then the Tommy Lawrence Arena, yeah. named after your brother. Tommy was the ultimate farmer. He was a good businessman. He, he was a good farmer. He had a great personality. Uh, and this can all be substantiated by other people, not because normally people don't talk nice about their brother, but Tommy, I do. Um, Tommy was the uh, secretary of the Florida Farm Bureau Federation. And he was involved in, you know, in agriculture around the area. And there was a committee formed, uh, it included Farm Bureau members and others. Tommy was on that committee, uh, kind of spearheaded it. And that committee is the one that recommended to buy the properties where the Volusia County Fair is currently located. And what year would that have been that we're talking about approximately? Um, Great goodness, that would have been probably, uh, Tommy died in 98, so that would have been in the late 80s. In the 80s, okay. Uh, but they bought a, a, a large portion of the property with the help from the county and the fair association. Mm -hmm. And uh, he kind of spearheaded that program. Unfortunately, he died of cancer short of 60 years old and they had just completed the, what is now the Tommy Lawrence Arena, and uh, Tommy had been involved in politics and whatnot, and knew several of the councilmen, and they suggested, with Farm Bureau's blessing, to name it the Tommy Lawrence Arena, uh, to which it is this day. Mm -hmm. Well, you've done quite a few things um extracurricular kinds of things and volunteer and received one award from the Florida JCs 
in the Florida Consumer Finance Association as one of Florida's five outstanding young men. This is back in the 70s. Yeah, that's, that was 74. Uh, uh, I actually wasn't farming there and then. That, during those 70s is when I was at uh, cable television in the chamber. Mm -hmm. But uh, the local chapter uh, nominated me and the uh, Florida JC organization of you know, which Deland was a part, uh, they selected five people per year that had been involved in their community. And uh, I had been involved in the community at the time and I was honored with the, with that recognition. Um, the, I graduated from, you know, from Florida in 66, joined the Chamber of Commerce, the uh, J JCs, which was Junior Chamber of Commerce uh, in 67, uh, primarily because my mentor, as I mentioned earlier, Judge Bunky Blunt, had been a national uh, vice president of JCs. And when I took over, I think we had like 17 members. And that was 1969. JC uh, state organization required that you have tw 20 members to be a chapter. And we were a few shy of the 20 dues paying mem members. So those of us that were dues paying members uh, divvied up to pay the dues for three people that we picked out of Oakdale Cemetery headstones. They were, in other words, uh, phantom not, not <laughs> members not living. so that we could uh, <laughs> Uh, maintain our charter and the land. We then grew after that uh, to where we didn't have to do stuff like that anymore. Go ahead. Uh, where were we? Uh, Some of your other activities. Well, JC's, I, and I, mm -hmm. I was president, after the president of JC's, uh, our, was, uh, let's see, the director of the United Fund West Volusia in the early 70s. Um, I was also president of the Kiwanis Club uh, and I was also president of the YMCA when they bought their first building on Spring Garden. It used to be the old, what was called Compu Floor. It was where mm -hmm. they built flooring uh, was just set down on top of a floor and you could run cables through. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they sold it, we, uh, the Y bought it and that was their first building before they went to where they are now. Mm -hmm. uh, I probably forget. President of the Merchants, is that the Downtown Merchants Association? I, I was president of the Merchants Division mm -hmm. of the Chamber of Commerce too. Uh, and involved in our church. Uh, which I forgot to mention. Yeah, it's I, the, I started, you know, yeah. my grandfather built the uh, Calkins Electric Building uh, mm -hmm. and had his bottling plant there. He and my father also uh, partnered on uh, building the, my dad was the treasurer and my grandfather was one of the contractors to build the Trinity Methodist Church and that opened in 1926. Um, I think, well, there was, it's no longer there, but what used to be the Bill Holler Motor Sales, it's now a motorcycle uh, venue on South Woodland Boulevard. Uh, he also, my grandfather, uh, had a hand in building that building. Uh, mm -hmm. So he, he was active in that. He just wasn't able to hang on to it. Jimmy, please tell us your involvement in the JC's Christmas Parade. Well, uh, like I said, I came back to town after I graduated. Uh, I joined the JC's in 1967. And exactly how, so a lot of these places that I got to where I was a chair or a president, I forgot I was president of the Qantas, uh, forgot that, was because at the time nobody else would do it. so. I, just said, I'll do it. 
that was kind of like the Christmas parade. After a couple of years, uh, the several people who had been out, been doing it for several years said, I'm out of here. So I took over, and for close to 20 years, uh, I worked on the Christmas parade every year. Uh, for 13 years, I was the chairman of the parade and had the good privilege of standing at Minnesota and the boulevard and waving to the police when to start the parade. And boy, was I ever happy to see the parade go down the road because <laughs> it was a lot of work, but it, it was fun. Well, you actually ran the, ran the parade. Well, I was chairman. How many, of, chairman of that I was well, chair. How many years? Uh, close to 20. There was, up until recently, there was some of the remnants of the old Christmas parade committee that was doing the parade. Uh, I'm not sure who actually puts it on anymore. Will the JCs still put it on? Do they not? Uh, the, the JC chapter uh, is pretty much inactive, uh, but it was the last several years of parade has been put on by a group that are former JCs primarily. Let's see, you, you did, your family started the Trinity Methodist, and I believe you went to St. Barnabas because Patty yeah, Patty was involvement uh, there. Well, after we married, Patty Methodist. was uh, uh, had been raised Catholic, but we went to Trinity Methodist Church. Um, the uh, And Patty always missed the liturgy of the Episcopal Church. Uh, but in, I believe it was 1984, she went to work uh, as a teacher at uh, St. Barnabas Church when Father Dave Sula was there. And the net following year, she was uh, promoted to the principal of the school. And That's where I met her. Uh, Father Dave, uh, whom I had met, Patty got me to go to a Christmas Eve service the year before. And I met Father Dave Sula, who was the rector at St. Barnabas for 25 years. He was a retired, or not a retired, but a former Marine, and uh, was far, I thought, from being a, a priest. <laughs> but uh, when he t told me about some of his backgrounds, but uh, the, with her being the principal, and uh, I had developed a good friendship with Father Dave, we moved to St. Barnabas. And we stayed at St. Barnabas until we moved to Cedar Key. When we got to Cedar Key, and Patty went to work as a teacher, um, and they found out that I had, or one of the ladies that was a bus driver at Cedar Key, um, knew that I had my bus driver's license. And she had told me, when you move to Cedar Key, I'm gonna retire, and you're gonna be the bus driver. And, and this was it. several years before we moved there. So when we moved, she reminded me, that, we got there in August. In October, she retired, and I took over as a school bus driver. But uh, we talked about that a little bit, I think, before. Um, anything else? Do you want to add? Because I had some other questions to ask you about the land and how things have changed. And well, anything else you want to? Yeah, I, I, put in there. Um, as we talked about before we started uh, mm -hmm. filming here, uh, we as youngsters knew this as, even when you were in Stetson, knew this as dead land because the sidewalks rolled up at five o'clock. Um, when we came back, we noticed a marked difference. And then uh, just recently, the land has been selected outstanding uh, Main Street community. Uh, you can go downtown any night. Restaurants are open. There are, you know, shops open. It's just there's people are everywhere. That is where one of the biggest changes is. The number of people in this area has exploded from a few thousand to many thousands. And the traffic has gotten bad, I think, personally. Um, even to the point that the truck route, South, Spar South Spring Garden, or Spring Garden Avenue as I knew it, um, sometimes if you stop at the traffic light at New York Avenue, 
If you're not careful, you'll be backed up to the railroad tracks on Minnesota. Uh, and you'll have to go through three or four light changes to get, get through, uh, which was, that was never the case before. Uh, in fact, on North Spring Garden, uh, around Green's Dairy Road, Mr. Carroll Green uh, had a dairy. And dairy cows, you milk twice a day. And before the truck route, it was just a two-lane gravel road going north. Uh, in the morning, Mr. Green or one of his workers would go out and they'd stop the cars and they'd drive the cows across the road. And in the afternoon, they'd reverse it and stop the traffic and drive the cows back over to the pasture. Well, when the truck route went in, that ended. Uh, he couldn't stop traffic, so they had to come up with a plan. Because it was a very small two-lane road, and then they four-laned it, it, it and it, it made a, it larger. It was a two-lane, well, originally when they, the first uh, portion of the uh, truck route, mm -hmm. uh, which opened in the 60s, was uh, they paved it two-lane asphalt. Mm -hmm. It wasn't two-lane gravel anymore. Mm -hmm. But then semis were on the road back and forth, and he couldn't very well drive his cattle across. Mm -hmm. So before they actually opened the road, the Department of Transportation and Mr. Green got together, and they buried a six-foot culvert under the road so that every morning he could drive his cows across and every evening he could drive his cows back across, but through the culvert. And uh, you could, uh, in fact, we did horseback riding and would go through that culvert to get from one side to the other. You had to get off the horse, but you, know, you could lead the horse through and get back on the other side. I think when they did the recent, I say recent, just a few years ago, they uh, expanded the truck route. Uh, they. Uh, collapse that culvert and it's no longer, you know, and of course there's no dairy anymore. No sense in going out there looking to see where it was. You can't, <laughs> it's all covered up. <laughs> Did the but, truck route stop at Beersford going the other direction? Well, until when, what? okay, uh, originally before the truck route, uh, South Spring Garden ended at Beersford mm -hmm. Avenue. That's but when they put the truck route okay. in, it continued on beyond that and went around a big turn mm -hmm. to take it back to 17. Northbound, uh, the, it, the road originally ended at US 17, but they, um, with the opening of the truck uh, route later on, opened from 17 to Highway 11, for, so it mm -hmm. now runs all the way from Highway 11 through to 17. But the truck stop was still there. The truck stop has well, been the, there the for truck, ages. The, the truck stop, Big Rig truck stop. In big fact, the, the restaurant is still named the Big Rig. Uh, they closed Christmas Eve at midnight, and that was the only time of the year they were closed. Um, that used to be a favorite hangout of the fern growers in the wintertime when it was freezing because they were open 24-7. You could go uh, get coffee here. Some of the to die for biscuits. The lady in the uh, kitchen would cook up uh, about three o'clock every every freezing morning, so we could have uh, biscuits and honey. Mm -hmm. uh, but the uh, the the friendliness of the land is still there. People know their neighbors pretty much. They speak to each other. Uh, even with the growth of the area, it still has the small town flavor, which I remember as a kid. Uh, uh, you know, and not all the changes have been you know bad. You know, I, I mentioned the traffic and the and the population, but uh, you know we have stores now that we didn't have when I was a kid, even though we did have some the boulevard. There was a J.C. Penney's. Across the street was a Sears catalog store and a Western Auto store. And on the corner of New York and the Boulevard, you had McCrory's on one side and Woolworth on the other side. And probably a lot of people, if they view this video, 
won't know what any of those stores were because a lot of them have already gone out of business. Uh, Stoudemire's Thriftway was uh, on the boulevard and Truett Stoudemire decided to enlarge that and he moved out and formed what I think was probably one of the first shopping center areas in the land, uh, Westgate on West New York Avenue at Stone. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but other than that, it's still, it's still the land, it's still home. Is there any particular invention that had an impact on you or one or more? Yeah. Well, yeah, there's a couple of them with good impact, I think. When I was in high school, we finally went from manual to electric typewriters. And electric typewriters were, you know, you could do so much more, so much, you can make more mistakes quicker than you could on a manual. But uh, that one, um, another one's a calculator. Because when I grew up, my dad taught me on a, you stood up and you hand cranked when you'd make your entry and then you'd hand crank it. And uh, that was the calculator. But now with the calculators, you know, just a little, size of a cell phone. Cell phone is an invention that I, I am sorry <laughs> was invented. <laughs> You're not a big cell phone person. Well, no, I'm not a big cell phone person, no. I, I don't do. My daughters and my son get on me because I'm not on Facebook. And uh, My granddaughter, my oldest granddaughter, just wrote out instructions for me to learn how to text. <laughs> I don't do it yet, but <laughs> you know they're they're good to make a phone call. But I I enjoyed it more when you picked up the phone and said, "Sarah, I want to talk to Charlie." Yeah, and she'd plug you in. But they're called phones, but the young people don't use them for phones. No, no. Right. We we still like to use the phones. I understand that. Oh, uh, tell me what stands out as your most memorable experience or the best time of your life. Probably would be my growing up years. Uh, there was a group of us, many of those that I named earlier, uh, were very, we lived in the same general vicinity. We were um, very close friends. Uh, and you know, you get into an argument, you get into a fight, and you'd stand up and shake hands, and it was over. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'd get in the dirt and play marbles, and, ride our bicycles to the Athens Theater. Um, it was just a great place to grow up. And like I think I mentioned earlier, you didn't do anything untoward. You didn't pick green oranges and throw them at people because if you did, your parents would know about it before you got home. Uh, and it's just during that time, you know, of I guess early Teen years up and through high school, I thoroughly enjoyed. What advice would you give a young person today? Um, I would say to any young person, uh, be true to yourself. Uh, don't follow your dreams. Mm -hmm. uh, Rather than somebody else's. Uh, no. And you I, did. I had you, a, you really did that. You, you, you ended up following your dreams and pleased your father at the same time. I believe that from was what you told me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but again, that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't. I really don't regret much of anything that I've done. I've and just I've, I've loved life. Uh, I enjoy people. Uh, I volunteer at the hospital and at the, our church. Uh, I say our church because you and I both attend First United Methodist Church. I'll get that plug in there. Um, and it's just, you know, even though I've moved around and done several uh, types of uh, occupations, uh, they've all been learning experiences and I'm glad I did every one of them. How would you like to be remembered? Well, 
And first off, I would like to be remembered as somebody that, you know, thanks God for all the blessings that I've had. Uh, for the life I've been able to leave, to live, um, that I like people and like to help people. Uh, pretty much. I think that would that would cover it. All right. <laughs> well, I thank you so much, and it's been a pleasure interviewing you. And actually, it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> well, you know, we had to leave some to stories some out, yeah. but uh, thank you too because you helped jog my memory on some things I hadn't thought about for years. <laughs> thank you, Jimmy. And you too, Margaret. <laughs>